Right, it's 11 minutes past. Let's get into this, shall we? Because this next hour of the show is something I've wanted to talk about for some time because the person who is guest editing for the day has issued a list of provocations. And those provocations are not just for the industry that he is in, of course, for the pharmaceutical industry and medical practitioners. It is a provocation to us as patients. Now, this is about prescription drugs today, but Dr. Asim Malhotra talks about a number of things in terms of us changing who we are, but also in how we address medical professionals. But let's get back to the issue of prescriptions for a moment. Around 1.3 billion of them were dispensed by GPs in the UK in 2017. Now, the NHS in England spends around, here's an eye-watering figure for you, £16 billion a year on drugs, of which about £9 billion 9 billion comes from GP prescriptions and the rest from hospitals. Now, the most common drugs include blood pressure pills and paracetamols. Well, the NHS cardiologist, esteemed NHS cardiologist, Dr. Asim Malhotra, is worried about the sheer volume of prescription drugs we're using. And he's taking over the first hour of the show. Dr. Malhotra, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nihal. I'm delighted to be here. As a consultant, actually, I don't have to address you as doctor. How is what do you address if you're a consultant? You can call me a seam. I'm I'm quite happy with that. But, yeah, I'm normally normally doctor. Doctor, good, good. <laughs> I'm glad that I can still say doctor. Okay, um, Doctor Mahotra, um, tell me what is the question that you have for our listeners today? So the question is: Are the prescription drugs I'm taking a complete waste of time? Okay, so if you are currently taking prescription drugs. Do you ask yourself that question? Have you asked yourself that question? Now, I definitely want to reinforce the point that no patient should stop taking drugs without speaking to their doctor. So we are not suggesting in this hour that you just stop taking them. Absolutely not. Because Dr. Mohotra thinks that, you know, they could be a waste of time. Um, 85058 is the text number. Give us a call. 08. 08- 085-909-693 to get in contact with us. You can tweet me at BBC Five Live or you can email me uh, at afternoon edition at bbc.co.uk. All right, um, Dr. Malhotra, I was looking at some YouTube videos that you put out um, where you've been given lectures. Um, and also, of course, I follow you on Twitter. I see what you put out. I see the conversations that you have on Twitter with other people. And, and you made a, a list of statements which you backed up. But here's some of those statements. You said there's a complete healthcare system failure. You said there's an epidemic of misinformed doctors, misinformed, misled and potentially harmed patients. You talked about biased funding of research. You talked about profits before patients. And you also use this interesting fa- phrase, defensive medicine. What is defensive medicine? Well, Defensive medicine, Nihal, is basically the practice where essentially it's a it's a cultural sort of term in the practice of medicine where we will essentially prescribe meds or more more commonly use lots of investigations and tests to really protect from harm, um, from harming patients. But actually, we also forget that actually over over you know over testing over diagnosis itself bring, brings harm as well but that's what defensive medicine is essentially where there's a there's a there's a, almost a um a desire a cultural sort of practice within medicine to do something at every consultation with a patient and doing something often means prescribing a pill or ordering a test okay and this is a conversation that's been had a lot and there's one side that says you know GPs are handing these things out like smarties there's another side that says that patients turn up and unless they get something, they don't feel as though the doctor has done their job. I think that that's the patients like that exist. Absolutely, Nihal. Um, but actually, I think this is about ultimately this whole conversation is about how can we provide the best quality care to our patient and providing best quality of care to the patient relies upon using all the information that's available to improve their health and giving the patient information to make decisions. So, for example, um, a patient may come in with a certain idea of a pill that has been advertised or they've read about or seen on the TV. Dr. Google. As having some sort of great, amazing effect, um, maybe in preventing heart disease and or a weight loss pill, 
you know, we heard something in the news yesterday about this diet pill. And they go in with these preconceived ideas, um, actually based upon biased information often, because, you know, there's a huge industry that is benefiting or want, wants to profit from selling, you know, getting, getting pills out to people and making money out of it. But then what happens is often that information, when they come and see their doctor, and depends on the doctor, of course, um, you know, the, the information may then, that's biased, may then influence the decision-making process for the patient to say, I want this pill. I often have to deal with this, where then say, well, hold on a minute, let's just talk through this. Let me tell you exactly what the benefit of this pill is, what are the potential harms, what are the alternatives. And often when you have that conversation with the patient, they change their decision. They think, oh, actually, this doesn't sound as great as I thought it would be, doc. Hmm, I'd rather do something else, you know, rather than take a diet pill. I might just you decide for a few weeks to cut out my junk food from my diet and that actually might have a more beneficial effect which often it does so this is where this sort of concept of a pill for every ill comes from however the reality Nihal is that in my practice and certainly I very rarely see a patient then demanding a pill from me once I've given them all the information now one of the things that's I think a lot of people listening will be familiar with is the use of antibiotics. There's a big problem with overuse of antibiotics. And even friends of mine say, oh, I went to the GP and they didn't give me an antibiotic and I've got this sore throat. And I said, well, actually, that's probably quite a good thing because your sore throat is probably not bacterial. It's viral. Antibiotics aren't going to do any good for, for you and actually may cause some harm because you get side effects of stomach upset. You might be contributing to antibiotic resistance. So it's just about having that conversation using all the information we have. But the reason I made, you know, you mentioned some comments at the beginning there from lectures I give. It, this is actually all about truly practicing what we all would like to adhere to as the medical professionals, because we go into medicine to do the best thing for our patients, we want to do the right thing, is about practicing evidence-based medicine. Now, what does evidence-based medicine as a concept, what does it actually mean? It, it means using our experience as doctors, clinical expertise. It means using the best available evidence we have about research that's available on a specific medication, for example, or a treatment or an operation. But most importantly, it's about incorporating patient, individual patient preferences and values. And if you use all these three, then we can help improve health outcomes. But there are a couple of problems here. One is the best available evidence itself, the research that's out there, we are now becoming more and more aware is actually unreliable. I mean, to give one example, one of the chaps in uh, America I would describe actually as being the Stephen Hawking of medicine because of his academic prowess and scientific integrity, Professor John Awinidis, who's Professor of Medicine and Statistics at Stanford University, he did one analysis where he looked at around 60,000 studies and he said only about 7% of them were actually very reliable in terms of being high quality in the way that they've carried out the study, the methodology, etc., and relevant to patients. In, in essence, more than 90% weren't. So you've got a problem there that if you're using not very reliable information or biased information, you're not going to get good outcomes for your patient in the real world. And, this, and the third aspect is the... Sorry, there's a distinction between unreliable and biased, clearly. Yeah, sure. No, there is, um, but let's just say we're not going to optimise the best outcome, at the very least. Even if, if, if it's biased, you're not going to optimise it. If it's unreliable, even less so. So we're actually falling far short of what we could, could be doing with patients in terms of improving their health, because that's what we want to do. And then the third most important, actually, in this whole concept of evidence-based medicine is taking into consideration patient values and preferences. What does a patient actually really want? And is it in keeping with what the doctor thinks they want? And actually, we're not doing that quite often, because with most prescribed drugs, Nihal, and this is indisputable, and the things that we use in medicine, whether it's managing blood pressure or managing cholesterol or diabetes, when you look at the trial data, most people don't benefit. The question is, how much is that benefit? And is that good enough for you? So an example may be for one particular pill that you take for, and I'm not going to name any specific pill because I don't think that's fair, but let's just say, you know, something for cholesterol, for example, you know, the data may actually in reality say, if you look at it, that there's a one in a hundred chance for an individual that that will benefit you if you take it religiously for every day for five years. That's a more ethical, honest, transparent way of having that conversation with patients, which doesn't tend to happen. Um, because everybody thinks you benefit a little when the reality is that doesn't doesn't actually happen. And when you tell patients that information, often they think, well, hold on, doc, 100, okay, well, I've got a very strong family of history of heart disease and I'll take those odds. Actually, no, I will take that pill. Is there anything else I can do? And you might talk about lifestyle changes, which I think is more, much more important. But many other patients say, well, actually, I don't really quite fancy those odds, even without talking about side effects, even without talking about potential side effects. But actually, that's this whole concept, this movement about 
improving quality of healthcare ultimately is about putting ethical care of the patient first. And that means we need to adhere to these principles. But the reality, the system has got us to this point where we haven't actually been practicing in the truest sense evidence-based medicine. And we've got an over-medicated population as a result of it. And it's causing quite a lot of harm. And one of the reasons I have sort of campaigned or been on this mission, and I'm also a big advocate for lifestyle changes, is because our healthcare system is failing. You know, it, how often, you know, every week we're hearing a story about stress on the NHS. I myself have been qualified for more than 17 years. I realized or observed um, as an as a NHS doctor working in, in the NHS, you know, probably around seven or eight years ago, seeing more and more stress on the system, more and more people coming in with chronic diseases, more and more prescriptions, more, you know, more stress on doctors. And I'd seen that develop over my career as a doctor. And I thought to myself at that point, I said, listen, there's clearly something wrong here. Uh, unless we sort this out, our healthcare system will collapse. And we are having this conversation now years later. So I, mm. I think there are solutions that we've got to sort this out, but they need to be implemented and we need to have this discussion. OK, well, we are definitely having this discussion. Let's speak to um, Dr. Aisha Awan, who is a GP and joins us now. Dr. Arwan, thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What do you make of Asim's question? Are the prescription drugs you're taking a complete waste of time? Um, I think it's a, it's a question that we have heard in the media over the last uh, three or four months, particularly. There was a, um, a very popular documentary that came out looking at patients who'd been prescribed antidepressants and what the evidence base was for that. And it wasn't particularly sound and solid. And it was done by um, Dr. Zand Van Tolken on, on, on Channel 4. And it was a very interesting watch. And there was, a, there was a lot of discussion on Twitter about, should I stop this medication that I'm taking? And I had patients who were, who, who were very interested in, in, in this. Now, as a GP, um, we have our, as our number one priority to keep our patients safe. I have to manage their expectations. I have to make sure that, that any medication that I prescribe them isn't going to cause them harm. And sometimes I can't guarantee that because you don't know whether a patient is going to react to medication. I have to educate them about its pros and its cons. I have to make sure that I follow them up to make sure that it's doing what it's meant to be doing. And I have to maintain a relationship with this patient. I have to be honest with them. I have to take on board any concerns that they might have. And I have to do that in 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. Malhotra mentioned that our healthcare system is, is failing. I don't think it's failing. I think it's actively being pushed over a ledge. I think, they're, um, I think that we are underfunded. I think that there is a lot of pressure on doctors, on nurses, on people working within the system. We are vastly um, underfunded and we have a huge shortage of staff. D Dr. Now, Arwen, is it though necessarily the case that you're being underfunded if the NHS in England alone is spending 16 billion a year on drugs of which 9 billion comes from GP prescriptions of which many may not need to go out in the first place so and 9 billion know, pounds may I'm not saying that every prescription of course I'm not saying that every prescription a GP prescribes is a complete waste of time but isn't there money to be saved there so there, there's a lot of money that can be saved in, in many places, but I can assure you that we are actually prescribing medication more safely now than we were doing a decade ago. There are a lot of checks and balances now in terms of the medication that we prescribe. Most practices will have pharmacists that are working alongside GPs. Now I'm going to take you back to, to a decade ago where the vast majority of medication, whether it was for, um, for heart disease, whether it was for diabetes, was actually prescribed in hospitals. Now, over the last decade to 15 years, that's actually moved into primary care. We're now pre prescribing the vast majority of this medication. It might sometimes be started in hospital, but GPs are prescribing this now, and we're, mon we're taking over the monitoring of this long term. A lot of patients who are listening now will understand that. They might have been started something by a hospital consultant, but the GP is the one who's prescribing it for, for a decade. Um, and oftentimes longer than that. So saying that 9 billion is what the what GPs prescribe, yes, we do, but we actually have had a lot of responsibility shifted to us and we take that responsibility very seriously. We work alongside pharmacists to make sure that we're prescribing the right thing. But to come back to one point, are we over are we over medicalizing patients? Yes. Is there an 
is there definitely a role for lifestyle to take patients off a lot of medications that we're prescribing? Yes. I think patients come in sometimes with an expectation that there is, as Dr. Maholtra said, a, a pill for every ill. And trying to change that mindset is very, very challenging. We have to think about how we're going to tackle this. We need to take a step back from giving pills. Um, we need to take a step towards evidence-based medicine and seeing what is actually useful for us to prescribe and when we should prescribe it. And we should have honest discussions with patients. But I ask you this, how am I meant to do this in 10 minutes while I am looking after it? ever more ill patients okay. well, well, who uh, already are obese, who already have a lot of lifestyle related issues that I do need to manage. Well, that's a good question, Dr. Malhotra, isn't it? No, it's, an uh, absolute, Dr. Arwen. it's absolutely um, a very important point um, that, that's made by my colleague there. I think, first of all, can I just say, so I'm, you know, I work in, in, in hospital medicine. And one of the things, again, as I said, I saw more and more people with more chronic conditions. But interestingly, over the time, we've actually got less time to manage them. Even in hospital medicine, as a consultant cardiologist, if I have a referral from a GP, I have 15 minutes. You know, when I started off as a qualified doctor, Nihal, um, as a junior doctor, I'd sit in with a consultant in a clinic, for example. They would have half an hour with a patient who was less complicated than the patient now. So this this point about the manage the time management is absolutely very relevant. However, having said that, I myself have had to kind of condition and learn myself as I've gone along over the years and got really interested in the research around impact of lifestyle and health. And I still manage. And I'm, I'm not. It's not about you know. This is not sort of um, taking sort of higher ground here in any way. It's very doable. I still manage to have a conversation with patients even in that time about their lifestyle and have a very and actually follow patients up and they come back to me and people reverse their type two diabetes or they manage to coming off come off their blood pressure pills you know at the same time as dealing with the referral from the gp about a question mark about something to do with heart disease but, but so, so it's doable it's but doable Do dr Arvin's point about changing the mindset so what are the barriers to changing the mindset so we as patients don't think that there's a pill for every ill and and and, and is there an orchestrated sense that we don't want to change the mindset. Where would that come from if there was anything like that? Because you could ask yourself, well, there is a lot of money in prescribing us drugs. I mean, it's yeah. a multi-billion yeah. pound, multinational yeah. effort. Absolutely, Nihal. So that's, you know, this is again about a mindset and a perception. And um, you're absolutely right. I think one of the other points to make is that the drug industry, a lot of the research that guides our clinical decision making come from the drug industry. They have a fiduciary obligation to make profit for their shareholders, strangely not actually to give you the best treatment. And there are lots of problems going on in terms of research integrity. And, you know, there are people who are dealing and tackling all of that. So you've got that that mindset. You then got the marketing that goes with it. And then the media actually unwittingly often are used to market that material. Um, like, for example, yesterday, we heard this story about this diet pill. Now, you know, I was contacted by various journalists to comment on, um, on this particular story that essentially shows there's a diet pill that doesn't seem to have long-term risks from, uh, of cardiovascular risk, other diet pills in the past had, but they showed four kilograms of weight loss in 40 months. And I thought, hold on a minute, you know, my patients are coming in and I'm giving them some simple lifestyle advice on diet, which really just means cut out, cut out sugar and ultra-processed food. And they're coming back with much more dramatic weight loss, better health markers, and they're doing that within weeks, and they're improving their quality of life. I'm thinking, well, hold on a minute. If there's a choice, fine, give patients a choice. Say, well, you've got this pill. And actually, the history history tells us, Nihal, with a lot of these drugs, that much later on after they get on the market, we then find out about side effects that were not made apparent in the original studies. So the perception is also the cultural perception of what medicine, modern medicine can achieve needs to change. You know, I, good health rarely comes out of a medicine bottle. And I think we need to get that mindset into people that actually the the future of healthcare, sorting out our health, our health and our happiness that goes, you know, hand in hand, form of course is a role of medicines. Absolutely, you know, there's there's a yeah, especially in acute and emergency care. But I think that actually people need to realise good health is going to come from ultimately come from lifestyle, okay. and we've neglected that. And also, it comes with you know the obesity crisis. I would say this is more of an environmental issue, not a personal responsibility one. Ultra processed foods are everywhere. So how do we make our environment healthier as well? Um, and Dr. Harvin, I know we, we we have to lose you shortly, but. Very quickly, again, the barriers. What do you see as the barriers to changing the mindset that you spoke of? I think it's very, um, I think it's multifactorial. 
And I completely agree with, with Dr. Malotra on this point that we need to look at society as a whole. I think the barriers actually are taking a step back and realizing this isn't just about what happens between a doctor and a patient in a consultation room. This actually starts with when our children start going to parks and there's barriers towards them going toward to that park. For example, charges, um, green spaces that are being eaten up by developments. When we think about school placement, when we think about nursery placements, you know, walking distance so that children get into the habit of being active and healthy. The way that our society is structured at the moment over the last 50 years has changed quite dramatically. I mean, I've got a lot of friends who drive their children to school because they, you know, the school placements are so far away because there's a shortage of schools locally. Now, if we don't address those issues, we are going to end up with lifestyle conditions. It's very simple to see that. But often what happens is we we get into this, we start looking under a microscope at patients, at what's happening with them, and we forget to take this step back. We have a population of overweight people at the moment. I mean, I've read statistics that are saying that, that my generation um, are going to be 50% of overweight, obese, with the highest number of, of um, chronic lifestyle associated medical conditions. And we are going to die younger than the generation before us. Now that is quite alarming. And we have an opportunity now to actually rethink um, the way that we plan, the way that we deal with lifestyle, the way that we educate our children and how we communicate this information to our patients. We definitely need to take a step back. The barriers again are patient expectations, a lot of publication of, of, of data that is, isn't as clear as it should be. And definitely drug companies need to take more responsibility about what they're, what they're putting out there. And also the media need to take a little bit of responsibility yeah. about how they present that data. Yeah. Um, well, the obesity, I, I just wonder how often it's just handed to us in the media and we, we, is, and we and, regurgitate what we're told. You know. because, and do you know what? You guys do an excellent the... job, though, because I've got to be honest, you know, I'm contacted a lot to talk about medical, um, about medicines that have come out. And the reason that I'm contacted is because you, you are interested in knowing and presenting both sides of the story. You don't just want to put this out there. But for example, there was a drug, a, another weight loss drug, Orlistat, many years ago that was marketed. It had horrendous side effects, but a lot of my patients were prescribed this because it was deemed this miracle fat busting drug. The side effects for it were awful. The, oh, yeah. the long-term data from it is awful. What I've seen in front of my eyes is that patients have actually put more weight on okay. after yeah. they've come off it. So we, we need to think more we, long term perfect we've run out of time um for this section of the show but dr aisha owen thank you it's a gp for joining us uh, we're going to be speaking to another gp in a little while we are of course i don't want to hear from you because dr asim Malhotra has a question for you are the drugs you're taking a complete waste of time there's the provocation we'll be hearing from the industry after the news headlines it's now 34 minutes past one here's alison acton with them on digital, online, smartphone and tablet, this is BBC Five Live. Theresa May says there's going to be a fundamental shift in aid spending in Africa so that it focuses on long-term economic and security challenges rather than short-term poverty reduction. The Prime Minister is on a three-day trade mission to South Africa, Nigeria and Kenya. A man's appeared in court to deny conspiring to injure his three-year-old son in an acid attack. The boy suffered burns to his face and arm at a shop in Worcester last month. Six others are also charged in connection with the attack. Labour's joined calls for the government to do more to restore power sharing at Stormont. The Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary Tony Lloyd says the only way to resolve the issues is to get the parties around the table talking. And Ed Sheeran has sparked speculation he may have secretly married his fiancée, Cherry Seaborn. When asked in an interview if the couple had set a date, the 27-year-old pointed to a silver ring he's wearing on his left hand. That's the latest news. Katie has the sport. England's Johnny Bairstow says he's confident that he'll play in Thursday's fourth test against India oh, at Southampton. Absolutely. The wicketkeeper fractured his finger during the third test at Trent Bridge, but did bat in England's second innings. I'm confident that... I should be able to play in the game, but as I say, we've not trained yet. Without doing the skill and without being out there and performing in practice in the nets, um, then then you're unable to, to make a, a fully confident decision, if you wish. But from walking around, from carrying bags, from 
the improvement that it's made over the last few days compared to where we were when we left Trent Bridge, yeah, it's, it's come on a lot better. BBC Sport understands that Manchester United directors still have confidence that Jose Mourinho can achieve success this season. They lost 3-0 at home to Tottenham yesterday to make that their worst start to a season since 1992. The Guardian's Manchester football correspondent Jamie Jackson says Mourinho is feeling the pressure. I have no issue at all with the manager being unhappy about losing. But the wider picture here is he's got deep problems. There are fault lines in the squad, his management of it, the club. You know, the overall picture, there, is, there are big problems there. And news just in that Jamie Vardy has announced his retirement from international football. The 32-year-old has told Gareth Southgate he doesn't wish to be selected, but would play if absolutely necessary. So that's just coming. We'll have more on that later throughout the afternoon. Ahead of their Women's World Cup qualifiers against Wales and Kazakhstan, the England striker Ellen White and midfielder Farah Williams trained separately in recovery sessions this morning. The rest of Phil Neville's 23-player squad all trained together, including Birmingham City midfielder Lucy Staniforth, who's just been called into the squad. At the US Open, Johanna Conta will look to join Andy Murray and Cameron Norrie in the second round today. She begins her campaign against the sixth seed, Caroline Garcia. Conta hasn't beaten a top 10 player this season. Here's our tennis correspondent, Russell Fuller. Conta's American summer started in spectacular style as she dropped just one game in a Californian victory over Serena Williams. She's also had wins against Grand Slam champions Victoria Azarenka and Yelena Ostapenko. Conta's challenge now is to string together a sequence of wins in the same week. A virus hindered last week's preparations, but she does have a winning record against Garcia. Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic are also in action on day two, with Caroline Wozniacki hoping to avoid Simona Halep's fate when she plays former champion Sam Stosa. And there's coverage of the US Open on Sports Extra from five o'clock. And Great Britain have announced a 66-strong team for next month's World Championships in Bulgaria. The team includes all 16 medalists from this month's European Championships in Glasgow. And that's the latest from BBC Sport. This is BBC Five Live on digital, smart speaker, smartphone and tablet. And on the roads, the M25 anti-clockwise in Essex has been closed due to an accident. It involves two lorries and a car. There's also a fuel spillage. It's happened between Junction 27, that's the M11 Junction, and 26 for Waltham Abbey. Uh, the carriageway's been closed while they deal with that, and all the traffic is currently being forced onto the M11. Some better news, though. The M40 northbound in Oxfordshire has now reopened. Still queuing traffic, though, due to an earlier accident, which closed the road from about nine this morning, so for more than three hours between Junction 8A for Oxford and 9 for Bicester. Still congestion back past Junction 8 and there are still issues on the diversion route. That's the A40 and the A34. Alison Acton, 5 Live Travel. 5 Live Breakfast. Strictly does hook you in, doesn't matter what age you are. Once you start watching it, once they start dancing. I agreed to do this a long time back. I've been murdered keeping it quiet. The cat's out of the bag and I, I promised myself I'll throw myself into it. You can hear the puns now from Tess, can't you? Yeah. Will he bowl you over? Oh. Or will you make sure he's not out? That's right. <laughs> will he dance like a duck? Or will he glide like a swan? Oh, beautiful. Yes. How do you think he's going to do, Swanee? I think he'll do really well because yeah. he's so likeable. Yes, yes, oh. yes indeed. I don't, always the, the ex cricketers though. How come there've been so many ex cricketers on it? That's a question for you. You're cool. No, maybe not. <laughs> Five Live Breakfast back tomorrow from six. It is twenty-one minutes to two. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Asim Malhotra is here as the guest editor for the first hour. But I have a feeling that we'll probably return to this before the end of the show. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, you have a question for everybody listening. So the question is: Are the drugs? I'm taking a complete waste of time. And what prompted you to ask this question for people just joining us? I am very concerned actually about the overprescription of medications. Um, and it's not just me, the medical royal colleges that represent most doctors in the UK, they started a campaign a few years ago calling winding back the harms of too much medicine in conjunction with one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, the BMJ. So there is a big problem. We know that there are um, a lot of prescriptions that are dished out. We know that data tells us at least one estimate certainly globally suggests that the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer is prescribed medications. Half of that due to side effects, half, half of that due to prescription errors. So it is a major problem. In, in my view, it's a major threat to public health, but there is a solution to reduce these harms. 
And why did you say there was an epidemic of misinformed doctors? Misinformed by who? So when we talk about our, um, I talk about this healthcare system failure and this epidemic of misinformed doctors and patients, there are a number of root causes. Uh, one is biased funding of research. So this is research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients. Bias reporting in medical journals. So these are the journals that we rely on to give us information, reliable information. Bias reporting the media, Nihal, again, a big, big aspect. I mean, a lot of these companies, from they rely on getting their information out there and marketing their drugs or a certain food or whatever else through use of, of media. Um, uh, and then you have defensive medicine. And one last but not least, which is a really interesting one, which I think we'll come on to later with with a patient we're going to speak to, is um, actually an inability of doctors and patients to understand and communicate health statistics. In other words, what happens is that we get information about medications, and this has been, it's been historical, where ultimately our own perception as doctors is that we exaggerate in our minds the benefit of a drug or a treatment and underplay the harms, and therefore that brings a huge bias into the decision-making process, and then the patients are then misinformed and unwittingly, often unwittingly harmed, especially if the, the side effects actually outweigh any benefits. So that's where, if you combine all these together, you have this epidemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed patients. Um, let's move the conversation on by talking now to Carl Claxton, who's Professor of Health Economics at the University of York and was a founding member of the NICE Appraisal Committee. Professor Claxton, thank you for joining us. Hello. What do you make of Dr. Malhotra's comments about the biased funding of research, biased reporting in medical journals? I think I think all those things are true. I think one of the difficulties that we have is much of the research that's done is done in order to get a license for new drugs. Uh, and the kind of research that's done to get a license isn't necessarily the kind of evidence that we need to make sure that we identify those patients who can benefit most and figure out what the very long-term costs and benefits of those drugs are going to be when we use them in the NHS. Now, I think we're very fortunate in the UK. I think NICE, that's the National Institute uh, of Health and Clinical Excellence, is a body which stands out in the world as attempting to pull together all the evidence and try and think very carefully about how this kind of research is going to translate into clinical practice. Think carefully uh, and try and pull all the evidence available together to figure out what the long-term benefits are likely to be, what the harms are likely to be, what the impact is likely to be on length and quality of life, but also what the costs are going to be for the NHS because, of course, the additional costs of new drugs really matter because those costs are resources that could have been used to offer effective care to other patients. And, you know, at the start of the programme, you mentioned that £16 billion, um, is spent on drugs in the NHS, and that's true. 13, more than £13 billion of that 16 has been spent on new drugs, branded drugs, which, generally speaking, have quite modest benefit, but prices that are, generally speaking, un unaffordable for the NHS. So I guess my disagreement, I suppose, would be that I do see great harm. The primary harm, I think, or the greatest harm, is the, um, the fact that much resource is being devoted to new branded drugs, which could have had a much greater effect in the NHS, I think, you know, the Cancer Drugs Fund is an excellent example. We're continuing to take £400 million away from the NHS to fund new cancer drugs of relatively modest benefit with very limited evidence. And we know, and the evidence suggests, that the ratio of harm to benefit is about six to one. So I share the concerns, but I kind of identify the source of concern really around drug prices. I think we do a very good job in the UK of assessing the evidence, uh, such as it is. I also think that primary care is one of the reasons why we probably do have the best healthcare system in the world. I don't see that compared to other countries we have a significant problem of over-prescription compared to other healthcare systems where doctors actually get paid uh, to prescribe to prescribe to prescribe new drugs. I'm also a little bit worried about the idea that somehow this becomes the responsibility of the patient and it's somehow a cultural issue about individuals going to the doctors and kind of demanding new drugs. I think things lie much deeper and um, 
i think we've got a good process of assessment. i think what we really do need though is to make sure that we turn that assessment into much more reasonable prices for the and nhs. there's a lot in there from what professor claxton just said dr mark hotcher what would you like to come back on specifically? no i think i think a couple of points. um i, I completely agree uh, with, doc, with dr claxton actually and, and i think he obviously has a lot of experience with nice who have a, a lot of respect for and i think you know they've, they've done an amazing job over the years certainly in terms of evaluating drugs and deciding cost effectiveness. I think one of the problems that I'm sure he acknowledges as well is that a lot of the information and data that NICE use to make those decisions is that there's been question marks about that more more, and then obviously NICE have limited information to then make decisions. So that's, that is one problem. It, it, may, um, it may just sound extraordinarily naive of me, Professor Claxton and, and Dr Malhotra here, but we as patients walk in to see a medical professional and we believe that what we are being prescribed has gone through a rigorous, medium to long-term process of R&D and then testing and then peer review and then more research to ensure that what we are being given is something that will aid us. Now, you're both making that sound as though perhaps we're naive to think that. Well, Nihala, what I would say, actually, it's not just patients. It's doctors also that are have been naive. I've been naive to this. I mean, I've only become much more aware of the problems with clinical research in the last few years. Up to that point, I literally took everything as gospel truth and, and gave my prescriptions to my patients. But then who can you such... trust? You know, this is, this is, you know, where is the... Professor Claxton, who yeah. can we trust? Well, I think, I think what I would say is that NICE does do an excellent job, is aware of some of the difficulties with the kind of data that we have available following the regulatory trials. Well, not an excellent it... job, but all due respect, for Claxton, does a job as good as you can do considering what you're being fed yeah. would probably be a more realistic interpretation of what you have both just said. I think that's, I think that's absolutely fair. I think NICE does the best job it can do with the kind of data that we currently have available from right. the regulatory trials. One real worry is that there has been a constant pressure for early approval of medicines. That's been true in the United States. Uh, the way in which the FDA, the, the, the body that regulates drugs in America, has been reformed. It's also been true in this country. There's been a real push for accelerated ask, uh, access to new drugs. The consequence of that is that the kind of data we get at regulation is even weaker and poorer. And I do think we should all be concerned about that. Um, that not only we've got weaker evidence in terms of figuring out what the benefits and harms might be, but bodies like NICE are having to work with less and less in order to figure out what is the most appropriate use and issue guidance to, to general practitioners and hospital doctors about what the NHS can afford. So um, I suppose my summary would be, I think people do need to be aware that these are difficult matters. I think NICE does a good job at assessing that evidence, but all the pressure to make new drugs available more quickly is starting to undermine the evidence base for clinical practice. Okay. And the idea that we can approve something, the, the other thing that's been happening is the argument that, you know what, we're not sure if it works or if it works well, but if you approve it and we use it in patients, then we'll find out. It's this notion of real world evidence. I, I find that really quite um, concerning because what kind of data will we gather in that process? It's not going to be the kind of data that really confirms whether or not this worked because we don't know what would have happened if the patient had not had that drug. And secondly, once we allow new drugs to be widely used, it's going to be very difficult for us to change our mind and decide that that drug is no longer effective enough or positively yeah. harmful. So I do think there are real reasons for concern. Professor Claxton, uh, I know Dr Mahotra wants to come back in. Before that, though, Dr Mahotra, I want to bring John in who's called in and uh, I want us to hear what he has to say. John, very good afternoon to you. Afternoon, Mahal. Thank you for joining us. Now, you're a diabetic, is that right? Uh, yeah, type 2. I've been since I was 21, so, so, so just coming up for uh, 18 years now. So, so tell us what, what you think of Dr Mahotra's question about whether well, it is a waste of, of time. And Dr Malhotra, meet John. John, meet Dr Hartley. Hi, John. Professor Claxton. Is here hi, well. So yeah, tell us. My sort of main issue was I've, been, I've had a, a heartburn condition for the past six or seven years. I was getting real severe, severe sort of 
chest pains and heartburn to the point where I was in the mornings I was, I was actually being sick from it, from coughing and everything. Uh, I went to a doctor and he put me on uh, Amoprazole, which treated the symptoms. But I've been on that for the past six or seven years and I've had no sort of test to find out why I was getting those symptoms or no sit down and chat about lifestyle or anything like that like you've spoken about. You've had no lifestyle chat? Lot. Not really. No, not involved. In obviously, I have involved in my diabetes and that. Obviously, right, my diet, of my diets can they've discussed quite a bit during that. But to do with this, I, at the beginning they talked about a, a test, a half a bactal test, I believe it was, but it's quite a while ago. Um, after the two week prescription and it was working fine, I said to the doctor about it. He said, "There's no real need for that. We'll just keep you on this." And I just, you know, is, is there not a way of sort of treating the condition itself rather than just the symptoms was my sort of question really in some cases. Dr Mahotra? Yeah obviously I can't comment specifically on the no. individual case but I have seen patients for... But the principle is exactly what you're talking I think, about. I think one of the, he raised a really important point there and this is part of again we talk about the cultural change and what needs to happen in medicine as well and there are obviously bigger external factors going on but one of the things as well, Nihal, is I learned nothing about the evidence base around lifestyle interventions in medical school. I certainly didn't learn anything about how we can translate that into a discussion with patients. And in fact, we need that more than ever. So that's slowly starting to change. In fact, most recently, there was a accreditation as in doctors that could be reward, rewarded for um, being educated, certainly GPs, about the use of, and this is relevant to, I think, relevant to John, the use of um, using a low sugar, low carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate diet to manage type 2 diabetes. And there's very good now real world data. And there's one GP called David Unwin, um, who in one year, just from advice with his patients um, with type 2 diabetes, managed to save in his practice about £45,000 on type 2 diabetes medications because many patients were able to reduce the dose up to 40%, some say even 60% in America, within one year of a program which involves lifestyle advice specifically on diet, which I've talked about low carb, are showing up to 60% of people can even send their type 2 diabetes into remission. This is extraordinary. We were taught at medical school, Nihal, type 2 diabetes was a chronic irreversible condition. But this is really interesting. It brings a lot of hope. And so this sort of stuff actually will eventually, I hope, infiltrate the whole of medicine where every doctor is empowered to give this information to patients and be, feel confident they can give this information to patients. So I think you know he raised a really important point there that we aren't actually trained or conditioned. It has to be part of clinical practice as well. Okay, John, thank you. Let's speak to Tony Royal, who's a guest, and then after that, uh, we've got a caller, Dr. Phil Needham, who's got in contact with us, and I've got lots of text to read out. Tony Royal, good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nihal. Uh, you had a heart attack, didn't you, four years ago, and you were prescribed several drugs, but you decided to stop taking them after research. I did. Why? Uh, well, uh, after about uh, eight or nine months of starting the cocktail of drugs, I started to feel quite poorly and the health was definitely on the way down deteriorating. So I started to look uh, into the biochemical books and uh, do a little bit of digging around to see how those drugs actually worked biochemically to give me some indication of possibly the side effects I was experiencing. Um, and the reasons I'd been given those particular drugs. And the other thing I was quite interested in was the statistical evidence to justify them because there's so much smoke and mirrors that goes on with absolute risk, relative risk numbers needed to treat. I really wanted to get to the bottom of what these drugs were doing to me and were they justified. And it was soon obvious uh, why I felt poorly when you look at the things like the mevalonate pathway where the statins act. You can see why you're starting to feel the side effects that I was experiencing. Um, and then once I decided that the drugs were what was causing the problems, I thought I'd start a phase withdrawal of the drugs to see exactly how that would affect my body. With advice from a health professional? Uh, not initially. I was quite happy that I'd done enough research. Um, I brought my GP into the conversation a little bit later on, but I wanted to test for myself what would happen if I stopped particularly taking the statins. It's quite a high um, risk, um, isn't it? Well, I'm a fairly technical guy, so I was... I was pretty happy that I'd done enough research not to do anything dangerous. Uh, Anti-thrombotic drugs are quite important. I'd had a stent fitted. Those are important for the first 12 months, but then their efficacy starts to drop. So they would naturally have come off the list anyway. Um, but the statins, the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers and the aspirin, etc., apart from the beta blockers, which do need a phased withdrawal, the other ones are not too dangerous to come off uh, just to see what happens. And uh, sure enough, once I came off the statins, 
i almost immediately started to feel better and within a couple of months um i was almost feeling back to normal um and then i started to have discussions with my gp mm, dr malhotra yes um actually so i mean i think tony and i know i wrote tony's case up in a medical journal so i know tony's case very well because he'd come to see me as well later on to have a discussion about this and he was very well informed and i come back to this issue about patient preferences and values he made an active decision that he didn't want to take pills uh, and I'm sure Tony will tell you this. I think what's quite strong about Tony's story is that he changed his lifestyle and then only recently ended up doing an Ironman. So this guy's had a heart attack, had a stent fitted. He's on no medications. And a few weeks ago, Tony did an Ironman, which is pretty intensive. I don't think I could manage No, I, I definitely. <laughs> I can just about get to the cinema to but, watch Ironman. Um, but um, please stay with us. I want to bring Dr. Phil Needham, who's a GP in Burton, who got in contact with us. Dr. Needham, thank you for joining us. Hello. Um, what do you think of what you've heard so far, and specifically Dr. Malhotra's provocation about whether you know the pills we're taking could be a complete waste of time? Yeah, I, I think you put it quite right there. Provocation. I think you know this is it's a very emotive statement to make that you know all prescriptions are, are useless, with the implication that you know we're being silly giving them out and all this sort of thing. The, the, when I rang, the one I rang in about being as Dr. Mahotra as a cardiologist is, is the issue that we have as GPs where, you know, we are told by specialists in hospital when someone's had a heart attack that, you know, they need what they call secondary prevention, which is like your previous caller mentioned, a statin, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor and a, a, an antiplatelet drug because we are told, and I've always bought into the theory that, you know, this works to prevent further heart attacks in, in the patient who's already proven themselves to be at risk by having this and, and as your previous caller said you know a lot of these have side effects they're a, a challenge to take um, and so you know people think well, why are we on all these things can't we do otherwise and yes if, if the guy you know gets fit so there's an Ironman challenge does all the right lifestyle things the risk may be reduced considerably but the patient who doesn't do all those things and is still at risk of a second heart attack, I think we do then have to sit down with them and say, OK, you don't want to take all those tablets which you feel are unnecessary. But you do then have a one in whatever, one in 10, one in 20 uh, percent chance of having a further heart attack. Do you really not want to take all these meds okay, doctor, and take doctor, your chance? Yeah. Uh, doctor, doctor Needham, Dr. Myalter wants to come back in on No, I think yes. re I think really important point there uh, that, that Dr. Needham raises as well is about, again, we have to do things that, you know, it's safe, we want to cause minimum harm. Do we understand mm -hmm. the information we're given? He's absolutely right. I mean, the general... You know, we gave statins, these are cholesterol-lowering drugs, one of the most efficacious drugs from clinical trials for treating and heart disease, especially if you've had a heart attack, you know, in the history of medicine. And for cardiologists, it's kind of, you know, the first thing we do almost when we, when we, when we see a patient with social heart disease. But when you look at the actual individual data for that individual, I know with Tony Royal, and I know I had this conversation with him because he knew this already when he looked the data up, he decided himself that, that that specific statistic, and if you've had a heart attack or have heart disease and statins, according to the clinical trial data, which we have to have some caveats with because these are selected patients, et cetera, that don't necessarily fit in with the real world. But best case scenario is about one in 83 chance that it will delay or you know, save your life, delay your death or save your life, and a one in 39 of a recurrent heart attack. So I think Tony, when he looked at that data himself, he said, well, listen, actually, and he had the side effects as well, I made a decision I'd rather not take that pill. So this is, again, about a transparent conversation but, with the patient. But, but we've only got about 10 seconds left, but, but Dr Needham, if Tony had come to you and said, this is what I'm thinking of doing, instinctively, what would your advice be to him? I would like to think that I would have had the time to talk to him about, yes, if, if you're going to get fit through the Ironman Challenge, and indeed if you're having side effects from these tablets, mm. the balance may be for you to stop them, but certainly have that informed discussion with him. OK, brilliant. Uh, Dr Needham, thank you. Uh, Dr Malhotra, last point from you. What can change? Well, I actually think what we need, Nihal, honestly, we need a public health campaign. We need media involvement. We need doctors involved at uh, grassroots level that we are, we are worried about the amount of medications people are taking. Our future is going to be through healthier lifestyles. We need to reduce the amount of medication. And, and, and good medicine, good health rarely comes out of a medicine bowl. We're going to keep you. So that isn't going to be the last word from you because we've got some callers that uh, we want to get you on in. So please do stay with us, Dr. Malhotra. Also, we're going to be catching up with Purcell Ascot, the actor in a brand new series on Netflix.